All right, welcome everyone. We are very lucky to have Ping Zhu with us today. Uh, her work is beautiful, it's handmade, it's done. Uh, it's been everywhere in the world, basically. You can't, you can't name a place where Ping has not worked. She's working on some animated stuff right now using her work as, as assets she was telling me about. So uh, she's gonna share with us today her, her process, what her work has been like and how it's evolved over the years. So I'll, I'll have her take it away. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for having me and good morning. Um, thank you for waking up so early to join me. Um, I have a presentation, so I will share my screen, but I will need permission, I think. That was me. Okay, now try. <laughs> uh, all right, I got it. So here we go. Do you see my screen? Mm -hmm. The million dollar question that everyone's heard. Um, okay, so that's exactly what I just said. Hello, and thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. And I'm very bummed to not be able to be there in person. But um, one day I hope to visit and it will be great when all of us are okay with riding on airplanes again. Um, so I am going to kind of go pretty general. Um, I know uh, you guys are all in school for illustration. So for me, um, I think it makes the most sense to kind of give you a sense of who I am. Um, where I was when I was trying to figure out what illustration was when I was in school and then the years afterwards. Um, so back in 2006, when I was starting college, um, I was very unsure about what this um, whole business was because I was just, you know, finishing high school. I didn't really understand uh, that this could be a job. I uh, took some art classes, but it was like really vague. And I'm sure this is something a lot of you can relate to, but um, just kind of thinking, oh, I'll go to college, I'll go to art school. This is something I feel like I can do. I was lucky enough to, you know, have parental support and, you know, pursue this. So maybe in four years time after I'm in college, I will learn everything I need to know and then I will be ejected into the world and it'll all make sense. Um, and so uh, as of now, 2021, I realize that it's very complicated. It's definitely not um, just one thing. There's plenty of things that I learned after school and I feel like um, basically there's so much about illustration that like compounds on itself like you have your basic drawing skills and concepting and like you know making a beautiful image and telling a story but then on top of that you're also a person who needs to you know think about how they're going to pay rent how they're going to eat enough food how they're going to like manage their own lives and you know how do you get ideas how do you make time for other things and basically uh life as an illustrator is not like it's hard to separate from work. And I know you've probably heard things like work-life balance. And if you enjoy your job, you never work a day in your life. But uh, I found that the reality is really a matter of like being realistic about what you're capable of doing and managing your capabilities and doing things incrementally rather than trying to like take on everything at once. So whether that's like, you know, today I'm just going to try and get enough sleep or like, I just want to be able to spend a little bit of time uh, looking at uh, reading a book or like taking a walk or like filling my sketchbook. I think things in bite-sized pieces has always worked out very well for me only because I get extremely overwhelmed as soon as uh, I think about having to, you know, do more than three things at once in a, any given day. Um, so this is just to symbolize that organization has been a key to many facets of this career. And whether that's just being organized in, you know, your day-to-day -day life or your finances or your files, or, you know, just prioritizing and making sure that you understand yourself the most, because this is a very solo type of work. Um, there's, it's basically like me in front of a computer or like at my desk kind of scribbling away, uh, reading emails and trying to figure out what I'm supposed to be doing to people who I've never, or I rarely actually speak to or see. Um, 
So uh, with all that, it's like you have a lot of freedom in what you get to do. But at the same time, if you're unable to like manage those things, it becomes a lot more complicated and it can unravel or get really messy really quickly. Um, so like I said, uh, this is just a very short background of who I am and where I came from. I grew up in L.A. I went to high school in 2002 to 2006. I you know, commuted from home, but I also lived very close to uh, my college that I went to, which was Art Center. So I actually lived at home the entire time I was in school and I just commuted back and forth between uh, my house and college, which in a lot of ways it was, it's probably different from your experience where we didn't have like dorms, we didn't have a place where people really kind of were there all the time, except for in class. So uh, the school itself was also very like, um, focused on, uh, it was, it used to be a trade school. So a lot of the incentives were to get people as prepared as possible to like work as an illustrator. So it was like very commercial, very, um, it was less about like, how do you feel today? And like, what, what do you want to draw? And like, let's explore this. Like, let's use a new material. It was like strategizing how to basically become an efficient illustrator. And in a lot of ways that was good, but I think in a lot of ways it was also um, hard to kind of experience that youthful college time in my life. So um, the other thing was that a lot of my classmates were uh, older than I was because of the age demographic of entering first years. Um, uh, a lot of people like transferred from other schools or kind of like made career changes and so I was 18 when I started and a lot of my classmates were probably already in their mid 20s or later 20s like some of them had kids and that was like really strange for me it still is a little strange but <laughs> um so basically I when I applied to school my um the way that the application process was was you actually sent in whatever major like the portfolio was tailored to whatever uh, major you were interested in applying for so I had an illustration based portfolio which was like life drawing uh, stuff that like I made in high school just kind of like mix of conceptual stuff as well as like technical drawings um, and the school was very small it was about 400 uh, 1400 students and the ratio was also pretty intimate so it was like one teacher to 13 students so uh, this was very different from like coming out of high school where you're surrounded by like at least 30 kids and you know everyone's like sitting on top of each other and so it was immediately like this environment change this you know shift in my mind and my uh, surroundings um, but you know generally I was like pretty excited to go to college I was like you know one of those angsty teens that really didn't enjoy being at home lied to my parents all the time like about where i was going when i really wanted to hang out with boys things like that so you know college still represented freedom even though i had to like meander home at the end of the day um and it seemed for what it's you know what it is based on like all american movies about college like i didn't really know what to expect um i just kind of thought like i didn't have to hang out at home all the time and i was like a little bit more adult um, but, you know, not to anybody's surprise, like college in itself is like a lot of work. It's this little boot camp to kind of train you for the real world. Um, and I think this was really the beginnings of like trying to do this whole juggling act of drawing and making art and doing homework and working and eating and like, you know, really trying to like train those muscles to work. So, you know, at the same time, it was like, being stressed about loans and like work study and homework, also having to drive. Um, and then there was like, you know, just things left and right of like time management. So I think this was my first exposure to trying to figure out how to make this life work. But I think a part of me was also like, I don't know if this is how like adulthood is gonna be. Like in my head, I still thought maybe I just like be able to draw all day and then somehow money will magically appear in my bank account and then I'll be able to like go to sleep and somehow food will make itself. And I was just not thinking about the details because it was too much. Um, but then luckily the whole food appearing thing was actually possible when I was living at home because I lived at home with my parents and they're there in the corner helping me uh, stay alive uh, food wise. Um, and so what I was saying about like my older classmates, uh, despite the fact that I'm like talking a lot right now because of this presentation, I was an extremely shy person when I was in school. I 
felt that part of it was due to the fact that I was 18. I was young. I didn't know anything. I basically went from high school to college without any life experience. Um, and all these other people around me, like knew who like Raymond Pettibone was. And like, I just had no idea who anybody was outside of like, you know, the people who were in museums and it was just a very intimidating and, um, kind of a humbling, but also like an exciting time of being able to kind of hide in the back of class and not fully participate, but feel like some kind of informational sponge where everyone was like talking about stuff and I'd write everything down so I could like look it up later because this was also a time before smartphones so I could Google things right on the spot. Um, but I felt really grateful, like in retrospect that I was surrounded by people who were so dedicated to making this career possible um and like really trying to like soak in everything because had I maybe been surrounded by people who were like me who wanted to just like explore and have fun and feel free and like you know maybe do a little bit of work on the side I don't think I would have really gotten the full hang or the discipline needed to get this career going and um I I think it's just you know with the cost of how much school is you also have to consider like if you miss a class that's like flushing a thousand dollars down the toilet and it was a lot of pressure in that sense to like make things all work out and education as like a form of investment with like an unknown return is um you know it's a little bit scary and these are things that you're like not fully thinking about, but I, I remember thinking like, oh, it's, I feel relieved that I still have like one year left or two years left to figure out what I need to do. Um, so, you know, being surrounded by all these like adults felt very like reassuring, but also intimidating. And it was like this mix of trying to figure out how I fit into everything. Um, and then, you know, eventually you do get ejected from school. Like, you know, the time there is limited and it's fine because um, it is just one chapter in all of this. So people never go to art school and things can work out. I just didn't think that I had the discipline to be a type of person who could forge into an illustration career on my own without any guidance. So um, I definitely uh, felt very like, unsure about what I actually was doing like my um I think by the last year and the last semester I felt like I was being edged off to like a, the side of a cliff and I was like no, I'm not ready like I don't I don't want to go yet I don't have a style I don't have like my stuff together I don't understand what I'm supposed to be doing um and I you know, like it, it was not really up to me. I think at a certain point you get shoved out of that nest. And um, I, I just remember leaving with a giant bag of debt and thinking that I'm not fully sure what this is still like, you know, rewind four years to thinking like, oh yeah, I'll learn everything in school. And it was like, okay, I learned some things, but maybe it's just like things like, oh, maybe send three sketches and, you know, work on tracing paper and, like things that were more technical, but in no way, there was still like a big gap between school life and actual applicable, like working life. So th this is just like a small example of the kind of stuff I was making in college. Um, I really got attracted to working with gouache on paper because I liked the way it looked. It felt very accessible. It was colorful and attractive. And I think I'm the type of person that needs to have interest in what they're doing in order to like be able to do it with uh I don't know like I have a feeling that when you don't enjoy what you're doing people can tell so I wanted to try and align as many positives and good feelings as possible for myself and this was really just something that spoke to me and I felt like I could still explore and learn along the way and you know if it's not obvious already I like obviously really loved animals and I wanted to draw them all day and I was thinking like if I could just do that you know maybe there's a market for these kinds of things maybe National Geographic will have an illustrated section someday and not only use extremely intense photographs like I had no idea um, and I think when I was in school there was also this notion of like just go to Barnes and Nobles and get magazines and find our director's names and send them your promos. And I, um, well, I actually have my promo here that I found that I made when I was in college and it's the same image of the tigers, but um, it was just one of those things where I wasn't fully sure how um, 
how to do it. I just heard a lot about doing it, but in reality, I had maybe printed a thousand of those and sent out like half of them to art directors where it was like me and some friends had like compiled our lists of art directors and just like wished for the best. Um, and actually, I think like maybe five or six years ago, someone who was at a publishing company that I had found the contact for who I emailed or sent one of these promos for was like leaving their job and had dug up the promo like four years after I sent it. And they were like, this is cool. And I was like, that's a long, I could have used that, you know, eight years earlier, but you know, you just never know where these things end up. And um, although this isn't really advice that I would promote, I, I, uh, that's the only promo that I've really made. So whether or not that's a good or bad thing, I, I really can't say, but you know, it, it was just how I ended up doing things. Um, so think, uh, you know, other people can, you know, maybe send out promos like every three or four months or six months or a year. Um, I think it all depends on what people are able to do. Um, and I just don't think I could afford making promos to be honest. Um, so anyway, I graduated, I was floundering for a while. I still lived at home. I was just kind of drawing and, uh, trying to keep myself busy. I think the, um, the speed and extreme like routine that I had while I was in school, like screeched to a halt by the time I graduated, because it was just, no one was asking me for homework anymore. No one was um demanding anything of me to be honest it was like a total 180 and I felt like uh kind of like suspended in it air I just didn't really know what I was doing um but you know what I learned was like staying busy and trying to like stay curious and prompt yourself with something that would like tide me over during just like to stay curious um and so hopping over to the life decisions part of things. I actually um, had a chance to move to London when I was in, in 2010. Um, the guy I was with uh, had got a job in London and he was like, let's just go. You know, he was also an arts undergrad and we were like, you know, let's do this. This is a new beginning. Maybe we could, you know, start a new life and start our careers and all that kind of stuff. So um, that was a really naive thing that I decided to do because I had no idea what, um, what that really meant. You know, like I had never lived in another country before. I had only been to London once, like a few months before, and I had no idea what it was like to like basic things of like getting an apartment or getting money, having a bank account, like learning what money looked like in a new country. There was just like on top of trying to start my career, I also was like extremely poor and like culture shocked from being in this new country. Um, and also, you know, being very naive and like 21 years old and not knowing that you need like a visa to live in a country for longer than a few months. Um, anyway, a little bit of uh, my backstory was like, I ended up getting married to my now ex who, what you know in order to stay in the country so that I could we could stay and like I could try and figure out a little bit of like my illustration career but the thing was like I had no money and for a long time there was like I didn't have the ability to work there and also I didn't know what kind of job I could get so I was being supported by my ex and also um like every now and then my parents would like send me some money because there was like I was not getting enough work at all to uh, sustain myself. And I, I mean, of the work that I got, it was like one editorial project for like from maybe one of the promos that I sent, it was like very arbitrary and not enough to string together to like pay my bills. So I just spent a lot of time like eating pasta and like discount food and being extremely depressed in a country that rains all the time. And uh, I was also really isolated. My friends lived on the other side of the world. I didn't know how to make friends in a new place where there was no community. Um, I also just stayed at home and drew. So the only thing I, I did have was time. So I tried to use that as much as possible um, by like making whatever it was. Like if it was drawing things around that I could see, like looking at photos and trying to like get inspiration from like fashion websites and stuff, just like anything to keep myself a little bit busy because I was like severely depressed. Um, 
And ultimately it was like a huge learning curve for me as far as like what to do in times of like loneliness and like just silence uh, and trying to stay busy. But also like when I had no money and I couldn't do anything and I had no friends, it was just like, I had to try and rearrange my life to make it make the most sense for me. And it was like a pretty challenging three years of my life. I'll be honest, like when people ask me about living in London, when I say it, it sounds very glamorous, but when in retrospect, it was like probably the hardest thing that I could have done (laughs) at the time instead of just like staying in LA and like having my feet on the ground and like a stable roof over my head, it was, um, I, I think I'm the type of person that likes to jump into the deep end and like figure it out later. But that is not advice that I recommend for people, especially if you are, you know, uh, subject to stress and anxiety. Um, it's not a great way to plan for the future. Um, but so while I was there and I, like I said, I had a lot of time, I also was using social media to kind of connect with different people, whether they were other illustrators in London or, um, like back home, I think it was 2011, 2012, like when things were still very sincere and people were very like genuinely kind and supportive online, whereas like now it's a little bit different, but Um, it didn't feel intimidating to reach out and just like tell someone you like their work or like share something and have someone just like randomly see it. And this was also the time around like Instagram, like becoming big and uh, Twitter. And like, I think Facebook was kind of beginning to be a place that people were using to like make their own art pages and stuff. But I don't think anyone had the impression that this was like a negative thing to be doing and to like be promoting yourself. And everyone was quite fresh and new to uh figuring out how to like present themselves online but it was nice it felt all of a sudden like after you know so much isolation it was really like oh there's people out there and they're also making art and some of them are also lonely it's like you get a peek behind the curtain for some other people's lives um so in the span of like that time you know work like was gradually picking up i had an agent who signed me after i graduated and i also kind of thought like i don't have to think about things anymore because this agent's going to help me but you know with the advice of like my classmates and also instructors I, they were like you know it's good to have one but only as like a support system rather than like someone who's like a silver bullet who will solve all your problems and get you all the work you need because a lot of it is still very much up to you. Like you still have to make work. You still have to, you know, make sure you're uh, making a presence enough so that people like know you exist so they can hire you. Um, most of the time, I think it's not even that like people don't like your work. It's just because like people just don't know who you are. And when you're just starting out, it's like, how would they know who you are? And especially like back when I was graduating, there was like no easy way as it is now like maybe now it's oversaturated with like social media but there was no like quick easy fast way to like get your name out there so I was slowly realizing that like you know I've been sitting alone in this apartment (laughs) maybe I should like share some of my stuff on social media and I think it was just one of those like right place right time um because I also have to add that like there's so much of my own career that I think I can only attribute to like dumb luck. Um, It's like, yes, I, I would like to say I work hard and I try to do like as good of a job on all of my jobs. And, you know, I try to be like personable and charming and like approachable and all these things. But oftentimes it's like, you know, I didn't know that Instagram was going to be like the thing that people use to promote their work. I just happened to have an account like early on, because that was just at the time that like I had also graduated I was like very lonely and like this was a thing and I was using it to like send photos of like food I was eating like most people were on that app to my friends and family back home um and it became a thing that I I never foresaw but it definitely helped to be able to like be there at that time so I am I don't have advice on like what the equivalent to that is now, but I do know that like kind of reiterating what I said earlier about just like continuing to make work when you can, whether it's just like a diary entry, like a journal scribble, or if it's like you make a project for yourself, being productive and like continuing to explore work while you have the time to do it is something that 
now, like while I'm doing a lot of work, I, I miss the free time that I had then. Um, even though like emotionally it was really draining and sad. Like, I just want to say like the balance of things has, is still hard to figure out because like, once you have something, you lose something else. And like, you have to kind of prioritize and move things around all the time. Um, so these are some works that I did like uh, in my last year in London, living in London. And then in 2013, I realized after those years that it was honestly like on top of like bank fees and uh, currency exchange, I was like not making any money because um, it was like, super expensive it's like london is still a very expensive city and so is new york but i think um it was just like a it felt like doubly hard only because like without like us jobs were paying in pounds and when i was like converting it it felt like even less money than before so um i made this decision because i was also like trying to rationalize like where I should live um, because it felt like unsustainable to live in London and continue like losing chunks of money to my agent, chunks of money to the bank. And I was getting most of my work from New York and like from the US. And I was like, well, this just doesn't make any sense anymore. I'm also miserable. I'm lonely. I'm sad. I don't feel good and I want to leave. So I decided to move back to the US um, and uh, like go to New York, you know, cause that was somewhere that I had wanted to go. I visited when I was in college and it felt very possible. Um, it felt like the type of environment that I wanted to be in. It was exciting and different from LA, which was like very car centric and, you know, isolating in its own way. So I was like, I just desperately wanted to be around people. And I was like, New York, put me in the middle of it. So um, I moved to New York in 2013 and I kind of did a similar thing where I was like, I didn't exactly have like a savings. I was about to like pay more rent than I was able to um, ever in my life moving here. The only reason why I think I took the leap was because one of my friends who lived here was moving to Berlin and her apartment opened up. And also because of social media, I had found a studio space in the pencil factory um, and it just felt like community check uh, apartment check, studio check, like it was all the things that I had wanted for the last few years and never found a way to get. So I was like, jumped on the opportunity. Um, unfortunately, it also meant that like, you know, working really hard in New York and trying to like take on jobs, like um, meant like my personal life was kind of falling apart um, behind the scenes. Um, I ended up like, you know, my relationship with my ex that I went to London with did not work out. And that was kind of like a really hard part of my life because I felt like I was struggling to choose between my career and like my personal life. And it was like, you know, when you're 25, 26 years old and you don't know what you're doing yet, it was compounding in difficulty. And I think I just like doubled down on being here in New York and like, you know, trying to meet as many other illustrators as I could, trying to like say hi to art directors when they were at like illustration parties and stuff and trying to get myself known that I was like, I'm in New York now, like I'm ready to do work and kind of promoting myself in that kind of social way. And luckily it was enough that people, some people would notice if whether it was like, you know, just the New York Times and like that job became other jobs. Um, but I like focused all my time and energy and attention on getting as much work as possible. Like I didn't say no to anything for years. Um, and I basically just kind of like let my relationship and my like personal life kind of fall apart on the side, which I don't recommend it as well. Um, it definitely was like a coping mechanism for dealing with another form of extreme depression and like guilt and all that kind of stuff and focusing on like, well, this is my career. I'm going to cling on to this. And this is like the most important thing. Cause I've like worked my whole life for this or at least not my whole life, but you know, a few years up until this point. So, um, you know, on one hand, you can say it was like nice to be able to get work. And there was a joy and excitement in being able to like, I'm in New York, I'm doing illustration. I have a studio, like all my dreams were kind of coming true, but to say that wasn't without a personal cost would be a lie. So, 
you know, I would recommend being mindful of, you know, how you're treating the people in your life when you're embarking on your career. And, you know, sometimes this, you know, we behave selfishly and we need to like focus on ourselves, but there's a difference between like having boundaries and like communicating versus like just shutting down and having no, um, you know, just like closing doors and not explaining any part of that just for the sake of like bettering your illustration career, which, you know, will take work and effort, but um, I don't think it should come at the expense of your personal relationships and, you know, your loved ones. So, um, you know, gradually over time. So these are a few slides of like how my work was looking like throughout the years. So it'll, the last one was 2013. This was around like 2014, 20, like 14, 15, um, you know, still trying to like do a lot of these like animals. Um, I think whenever I get a prompt, I always try and integrate some idea that's like, you know, not like a literal, I, I mean, I don't like, doing literal jobs. Um, so like portraits are not very fun for me or like depicting like a, a scenario that's like has to have certain elements like a car doing, you know, driving really fast, like is not like the most exciting for me. I do like the things that are more conceptual that have a little bit more like room to be imagined or, you know, abstract topics or things that are not in physical forms like feelings and um, you know, emotions and like mental stuff. So um, I just, I think like I turn to animals a lot as well because they're like a interchangeable subject. Like they can represent so much about like what we do as people, but at the same time, they can also have their own characteristics and traits that we can identify with like feelings and attitudes and fears and so on and so forth. And another thing was like, Back when I was in school, I was also very terrified of using color. Um, I think that was like a combination of being surrounded by people who were like extremely good drafts people and um, just like able to draw stuff like with their eyes closed. And I was like struggling. I was not the best drawer at all in my class. I was not the top of the class. I was, I would hope I wasn't at the bottom either, but like, you know, I, I could easily say like there was at least like five people at all times who were like crushing it better and more than I was um and so before I was like dabbling in gouache fully I was doing a lot of like brush pen work line work like trying to work with black and white more um and ignoring like environments and stuff but you know over time you realize that there's too many things that need to be like put into an image that involve space and dimension and perspective and things and like avoiding those would greatly limit my ability to like be an illustrator so it was you know I had to kind of like break out of that and you know again like I was saying earlier about like baby steps um starting with like really basic colors which might seem laughable but you know primary colors are primary for a reason and starting with that as a very non-intimidating palette was the only way I was able to kind of step up into more complex color combinations, experimenting um, with like values and temperatures and, um, you know, so on and so forth. So, um, and which I'm grateful for. And like every job that I've had has been another opportunity for me to kind of like push those um, experiments because, you know, if it's something about mood or if it's about, um, you know, some contrast or some level of like large and small, like you're playing with a lot of design elements that are also um, helping to tell this story. So I think like everything from composition to color to scale, perspective, pattern, all those elements are things that I think about all the time in my work um, in order to tell the stories that I'm trying to tell. And um, so, moving along still my new york years i think this was still a period of time in which i was saying yes to all of my work um and that also takes a toll on you because there's a finite amount of energy and mental space and um just general like capacity to create work at that level and at that rate uh it's it feels good for a while because you feel very productive you feel um 
like everyone wants to work with you or, you know, it's just like the work is kind of promoting itself and people see it and then it kind of like leads to another job. But at the same time, I was going through a lot internally and emotionally. And at a certain point, I just didn't have the capacity to come up with like another way to depict something, you know, like, or like a prompt would just not, I wouldn't have any ideas. And I didn't want to get to the point where I would start doing a bad job on my assignments because that would kind of you know counter all the work that I had been doing already to get to this point so I think it was it wasn't until maybe 2017 um, that I said no to my first job I don't remember what it was but I think at a certain point I just couldn't do it and I think for a long time I thought of it as if I say no, it feels like I'm being ungrateful or that somehow I'm too good for this job or the art director's never gonna hire me again, but that's not true. Like um, if an art director wants to work with you, they will find a way to work with you. And they totally understand that you're not someone who's going to be constantly available and doesn't have to be because you're working on something else. It could purely be because you are emotionally and mentally drained. Um, And it also like, it came at the cost of not knowing if that was smart on a financial side because I also have to pay rent. I didn't want to say no to a job and be afraid that no other job was going to come and fill its place when I was ready to work again. So there was that fear element of trying to trying to hope for the best that like by turning down this job, it wasn't ending my career. And so far it hasn't. And I would argue that being able to be more decisive about the jobs that you do take, not only give you better opportunities to do as good of a job as you can and also work on jobs that you want um, and do them well, and also give you time to uh, like kind of recalibrate and, you know, reassess what your mental and emotional state is in order to kind of rest and then move forward with whatever comes next because if you're not eating enough food if you're not sleeping enough if you're taking if you're exhausting yourself there's no real opportunity to do better later on so I try to figure out what is best for future me in ways that involve some risk taking but at the same time it I do know for a fact that like my mental state is something that is sensitive and I want to make sure that I take care of that first before things like making sure uh, I'm doing a great job. So it's, it's a delicate balance and I don't strike it perfectly every time. um, Of course, because I'm human, but I, I think these are things that are nice to consider and think about and keep track of only because it's very easy to kind of slip into just being focused or, you know, being overwhelmed um, and different things can come at you at any time. But if you have a strong uh, like core, maybe not, not just a physical core, but like a core for your, um, your work and why you're doing it and how you're able to do it, then whatever comes at you should be something that you can deal with. And I, I think everyone can interpret that to, in their own way and in their own lives and in their own work. But that is something that has worked for me so far and it's a work in progress. Um, some more work trying to figure out some like, I think there was a period of time where I thought maybe I could translate gouache paintings into digital stuff and it, may or may not have worked very well. It's still something that I'm trying to figure out. Um, It's also recognizing and accepting that they're two very different mediums and they're not meant to just look the same. I'm trying to figure out the boundaries between my own capabilities and, you know, how work can exist in two different mediums and still be from the same person. So um, some more examples. Uh, I I wanted to just kind of show a gradual range of change and, you know, different assignments, different degrees of uh, detail and color treatment and, uh, you know, complexity and also looseness uh, and also hopefully color. Um, 
I at some point switched from the Windsor Newton gouache to Krilla gouache, which has been very fun only because the uh, layering process is much different. I feel more able to experiment and go a little crazier on uh, the acrylic gouache over the water-based gouache that was kind of pulling each layer up as I was trying to stack uh, colors on top of each other. So this has been a nice uh, upgrade in materials. Um, and so this is 2020. Uh, uh, I don't know, most memorable year to date for us all. Um, it was also the year that I uh, had my first children's book come out. And that was a real bummer to, you know, do something that I've always been interested in doing and, you know, not be able to experience all the fun that comes with going on a book tour and meeting people and going to schools. So sometimes things are going to be out of your hands and I think that's okay. Uh, there will always be another chance to do a book, I hope, with um, other people. So this, these are also just some pandemic time art, you know, and <laughs> maybe that looks different from the other stuff. But again, I think I, I'm constantly trying to like push things a little bit, depending on like who the art director is, who the client is, who, who's giving me a little bit of freedom to explore and be, um, to evolve my work because I don't, I don't want to just do like dry brush gouache paintings all the time of animals. Like if you can summarize your style in one sentence, maybe that's not something to hang on to because it'll maybe pigeonhole you or like limit you to things. Um, if you're given the opportunity, it doesn't have to be drastic, you know, go back to like baby steps. You can just do it in small increments, you could just use a new color, you can use a different brush or a different tool to kind of play around a little bit, a new texture, a new composition, uh, because it's still gonna be your hand. Uh, I think it's really hard to mimic someone else's style consistently for everything. And that's why I also think it's really important to kind of keep track of like what's going on in your life and the things that inspire you or motivate you are different from other people, which is what makes you unique to you. And your work therefore is also unique to you. And you know, and have life experiences that other people have not. And those stories are really interesting and people will continue to be interested in hearing them despite, you know, the fact that a lot of us went through similar things last year of like being stuck in a pandemic. But like within that, there's also so much more and, you know, your background, your upbringing, your family, your friends, your home, like there's, there's an infinite amount of stuff that, you know, may not necessarily apply to, you know, a book cover assignment or something about a religion that you don't, you know, believe in personally, but I think you still have an understanding of what it's like to be a person and to relate to other things and that empathy will go a long way. So don't ignore yourself as a person. And I don't think that you should try and hide um, those parts of yourself when you're making work that is seemingly unrelated. Um, so just a few more pandemic arts that I did, <laughs> um, trying to spark joy in my own color choices when the world was looking pretty bleak. Um, and then this is this year, which has come a long way since before, but um, another book has come out during the pandemic uh, back in February. And I feel a little bit better about this because it feels like the pandemic is, mm, it, I don't know if it's finishing, but it's at least, you know, there's, there's hope at the end of the tunnel. Um, so I just wanted to show you guys what I did for 2021 and there's going to be more of that where it came from, but um, I now want to shift the conversation over to just some like general tips about like the whole work experience and what I've learned outside of school just from uh, getting actual jobs and dealing with that and learning along the way. So this is a scenario in which you've gotten a job inquiry email. And I just wanna emphasize that there's a lot of questions that should be asked before saying yes to anything. And it's always very exciting when you get your first job. So I just wanna hit the pause button and say, 
that this list of things is something that you should be looking out for whenever someone's approaching you, that you should be aware of what the schedule is, what the deadlines are, if it's like something that you can do, if it's feasible, you should make sure that there's a fee and a budget. And I've done pro bono jobs before um, for causes that I believe in. And because I think that giving back to a community and, you know, donating your time can be a good thing, but not necessarily for uh, someone who probably has money and it could easily turn into exploitation. So just make sure that you are in line with whatever client you're working with as much as possible. Um, I mean, I, I think capitalism is pretty terrible in a lot of ways. So I don't feel bad about asking for more money from clients that are larger because I know they have it. But if it's someone small and they need your help, I think that is a good cause. And I you know, don't wanna gouge them. Um, and that's something that you will figure out as you go along. Uh, and also you know, asking for the brief or whatever the article is, like what are you actually prompted to do? You want to make sure that there is the usage and rights. So is it going to be on a billboard? Is it going to be on Instagram ads? Is it going to only be on this website? Because those things also really determine the cost of how much your work is uh, able to go for. So, you know, uh, there's a lot of power in owning your own work. It's, it should be a hard thing for people to just simply get it for free or for very little. If they truly want to do whatever they want with it, it should come at a reasonable if not high price tag uh if you have a contract if they have a contract familiarize you with like reading it and if you have like lawyer friends or people who speak contract it's great to kind of talk to them and the thing about contracts that's nice is that if you don't agree with something you can just strike it out with a big red pen and most of the time you can come to new terms with the client because they'll just send you a really default one that is only protecting the best interests of the client so if you have your own contract, that's also great. Um, I learned that on Google Docs, there's templates for independent contractors that you can just take a look at and use. Um, there's a lot of other places online, but that's something that I found recently that was quite nice. And you can tailor it to whatever assignment or whatever situation you're in. Um, and ask a lot of questions before saying yes to any job because it's really exciting when someone emails you and you want to be like, yes, absolutely. But even before just agreeing to anything, you should be like, thank you for emailing me. I'm really interested, but could you tell me all these other things first so I can make sure this is something that I want to do? And if they run away, then you definitely didn't want to work with them at all in the first place. Um, and then when it comes to the brief, this is probably something that I'm sure in illustration classes you've already practiced, but you have a prompt, um, whatever is being asked of you. And for me, whenever I get an assignment, I start by taking a lot of notes, my initial read through, my thoughts, kind of colors or visuals that just come to mind right away. It's kind of a dumping grounds for starting my idea process. Um, and then I also start just sketching quick thumbs, like hideous thumbs to get out my ideas. So I don't have to like linger on those visuals as I'm reading it over and over again. It's like, if I put it down somewhere, then I can move on in my thoughts. And afterwards, I like to marinate for a while and just think about, you know, what is this idea? What's the tone? What's the emotional aspect? What is the writer trying to say? How are you illustrating something that's not just the text? How are you elevating it and adding like another layer to this, you know, whatever this assignment is? and you know try and figure out if this is an opportunity for you to be able to push your own work or is it um you know something that you um like you visualize right away and it comes really easily or is it going to take a little bit of time and you have to do some research and you know find some photo references things like that that's the marination period um and then these are just some other tips just general tips of like sending three variations and the best way to kind of make work that you like is to not send sketches that you don't want to take to final because inevitably it seems to be some kind of a curse, but art directors pick the one that you just don't want to do. Mostly because I think that sketch is usually the one that they've already asked you to do and they identify it and then they are like, yes, that's the one that I wanted and I don't care about your two other good ideas. So in my opinion, you should just not send them the one that they asked for and just show them the other things because that's what they're hiring you to do. Um, I think it's okay to ask for more time ahead of time because most of the time things are pretty flexible and 
if you know that you need a certain amount of time, it's a hundred percent okay to say, well, I think this timeline is too short. Can I have a few extra days? And usually they can say yes, if it doesn't conflict with like production stuff, but it's always good to know what you're capable of doing in the amount of time you're given. Uh, make sure the orientation is correct. I have definitely fumbled here where I accidentally made landscape piece when it was supposed to be vertical. Uh, just good to make sure, you know, there's no question that's too dumb. It's better to make sure. Uh, I also have like done the wrong sketch and made that the final when it was supposed to be a different one because I attach my sketches as like, e I just drop the attachments in the email. I don't know what order they're in sometimes and maybe they see it in a different order. So your number one sketch is their number three sketch and you just wanna make double, triple sure. Um, communication with ADs is excellent. Ask a lot of questions. Don't assume that they know what you're doing or don't, you know, just, guests, if you have questions, just email them because they're the ones who are, they know what the assignment is. So you don't have to play the guessing game. And being realistic about complexity is kind of tying into the time uh, tip where it's about, you know, if you need a long time to render something and understanding that maybe your sketch for an idea shouldn't be the most complicated thing um, trying to figure out your scheduling will not only save you time and pain, it will also be a good way to build trust with your art director because then you're reliable and you can deliver on time. A few more tips, I'm sorry. Okay, so it's always okay to ask for more money. I think that um, you just should try getting into the habit of that because oftentimes they will say yes. Uh, I don't think you need to like necessarily double it, but a good way to start figuring out pricing is just by asking how much do you need or how much do you want for this type of work? How much time is it going to take you? How much, uh, you know, I don't, I think even if you priced it ludicrously high and don't hear from the client, uh, I think those instances are rare. Most of the time, if you've overreached, they will say something along the lines of, we only have this much. Are you okay with that? And you can then figure it out. But you know, if they're just coming at you to name a price, then you should start with the, the higher number that you would like. Um, and if you can't take a job, recommending a fellow friend or illustrator is great because then, you know, it just keeps, you're giving back to the community, you're giving people opportunities. Um, I think it's a habit that I've been trying to get into recently. Uh, there's a lot of great directories out there for all kinds of illustrators and it's another way to help promote people who are probably trying to get a little bit of attention some work it doesn't hurt to help other people um and then staying organized with your files this one might be a little boring but i found after all these years of working figuring out where all my files are and how they're named has helped with uh trying to find them again especially trying to make this presentation and organization also applies for things like taxes and w9s 1099s and contracts because i'm sorry you're going to be a business person. <laughs> Illustration is not just um, having a good time drawing all day and people like throwing money at you. It's in fact, uh, you, you're your boss, your boss for yourself. And um, I recommend getting uh, these habits in line and getting used to them and it'll make your life infinitely easier. Uh, and I wanted to end a little bit on like just some process stuff, which I'm doing a demo later. So this is not going to be long, but because I work analog and I send everything in the computer, it just made the most sense to me to scan in the things that I work with. So the different tones of paper that I have, the paint that I have, and then converting that into uh, digital color swatches so that when I do color sketches, like, well, this, sorry, this is my idea graveyard, but um, basically, a, all of these sketches in color are done digitally and they're pulled from this palette of painted, scanned, eyedropper tooled swatches so that when I do end up painting my paintings, I'm not trying to line up the colors uh, that don't exist in reality with like high saturation colors in the computer. And that's like obviously give and take. Um, there's instances where it just like, you know, a red will be more vibrant in the screen and it's just like more dull and you can adjust those things in the computer. But um, the reason why I wanted to show you my idea graveyard was also that 
if you're sending three sketches for ideas, um, the art director is probably only going to pick one and there's no reason for you to throw those other two ideas away. And it's kind of nice to be able to like keep a tab on the ideas that you've had. Maybe it could be used for something else. Maybe you could like repurpose it um, because this is the hardest part of the job for me, which is like coming up with the idea and figuring out how, how to tell it. So oftentimes I just come back and refer to like, oh, I like this color combination that I did, or like, I like this composition or this idea or how fluffy this dog was, so on and so forth. Um, and these are just some non um, obscured color sketches that I've done. You can see it's really generalized, um, very blobby, hardly any lines involved. It's just to get a sense of what the painting will look like and feel like, figure out the temperatures and the values. So things read from a distance and from, you know, whatever scale it'll be experienced at. Um, and then this one that was used for the flyer, which is pretty cool. I, you know, I know I just said this thing about like, trying to use colors that are similar to the paintings, but you can see that even though like the sketch on the left was approved as it was, like the painting on the right was the result of that because um, sometimes I use colors that are not the ones that I scanned in and I, you know, try and push it just for me to have a little bit of fun. But um, this is just kind of the range in which I work and operate with my sketch to final. So I know sometimes like you see a lot of finals and you wonder how the heck they ever were made. Um, and this is just a peek behind the curtain. So um, yeah, that's that. And uh, that was just about an hour. And I didn't think that it would last that long, but there's so much information to talk about when you're an illustrator. And I hope that it wasn't super boring. And this is my info, feel free to email me or, you know, Get in touch if you have any other questions and I will be more than happy to answer them if they're reasonable. And if it's not like a homework assignment where I have to answer 15 questions about being an illustrator when it's your assignment, don't assign that. And also don't email people those things. It's really hard to answer all those questions. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great job, Ping. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Yep. Well, yeah, you're so right. Don't send illustrators questions to answer for your homework <laughs> assignment. Uh, it's just hard. Although I did have someone offer to pay me and then I said, yes. Wow. So your time should be paid for. <laughs> right. Well, we got um, a few minutes. We can answer some questions. If anyone has anything at the top of their mind, you had a lot of great, I mean, you, you covered a ton of range there. Um, I loved what you said just about the freedom of uh, saying no and and like treating your future self well uh, or being nice to your future self, which is when you're leaving school, it is so hard to say no because you just think it, everything is going to end. If I if I mm -hmm. take care of my body or decide not to do an all nighter again or something like that. Yeah, that's very helpful. Yeah, it's true. I had a lot of classmates who found it to be a badge of honor to pull all nighters and I was like, well, I have to drive home. I don't know where that energy is going to come from. I don't want to sleep on this table. So I'm going to go to sleep in my bed and come back and not drink six Red Bulls. You know, like they're just, it's different. People are different. Their bodies are different. And, you know, to this day, I actually, I don't know what Red Bull tastes like. I don't drink energy drinks, but you know, it's each to their own, but it's not a bad idea to take care of your body. I think you need it to be alive and to work. <laughs> so it's, it's just that simple logic. <laughs> Um, if you have, a, if anyone has a question, just put your name in the chat and I'll call on you. But I've got one for Ping. Maybe can you talk about the tension between digital and analog these days? Like you obviously make stuff by hand and what do you feel pressured to like learn, procreate and have that in your toolbox? I have seen a lot more um, clients ask for things in animated form and I I think it's just because of social media and the attention span that we have now, which is, you know, catching the eye, making it interesting and movement is a little bit more intoxicating than some a static image. Um, with that said, I don't think that you necessarily have to make everything digitally in order to achieve that. I think digital is just another tool. Analog is the tool that I use mostly because I'm familiar with it and I know how much time it takes for me to do something analog. And actually for me, doing something digital is more time consuming because there's like tools and layers and like things that I don't fully understand yet. So it, there's a learning curve for me. Whereas 
if that's just what you're comfortable with doing, I think it's meant to be different. You know, like I think for a long time, I thought like you could just like use the digital tool to make it look analog, but some people can do that, but I, I don't think I'm technically capable of it. And um, as far as trying to figure out what material you want to use in order to do the work that you do, it's really just, you know, is your tool limiting you or is it helping you explore more ideas? Is it expressing your ideas? Is it something that you're able to work in within a reasonable amount of time in order to like finish the project? Because I think if like, if it's taking too long, then it's not a practical way and that will cause it to be a more difficult assignment. Um, and I think right now, if you're in school and you're experimenting, I definitely think it's worth just playing around with and seeing what, what you can do. Um, I apply my painting skills to how I use Procreate. So yeah. I, I, there's probably a more efficient way of doing it. And there's like shortcuts and things that I, I'm not familiar with at this point, but I ultimately like want to be interested in what I'm making. So whether that's digital or analog, um, I think that's up to you to decide and what you're comfortable with, what you're able to do. The image results will be different, but you can also do a hybrid. You can try this, you can do, you, you can do both, you know? And I have sometimes, people sometimes mistaken my analog stuff for digital stuff, maybe because there's so much good digital art out there. Um, but I'm, I'm learning, I'm still like figuring out how to best work in digital, but I don't think there's like one or the other, like it's a, you know, death sentence if you're like deciding to do analog forever now kind of thing. I think you should, you should do what you enjoy doing and like in the medium that you find the most joy in using. Yeah, what, we had a question about how do you uh, work in animation if your stuff is gouache paintings? You said you're working on assets right now for something in LA that's being animated. What's that, what's that process like? Um, so I am fortunate enough where these kind of assignments, they have animators. Um, I'm working with Buck in LA, they're an animation studio, but they also hire a lot of freelancers to do um, like key art or design and they're just meant to be static images. So oftentimes when I do have something that is requested to be animated, there are animators out there that uh, I've not personally hired. My agents connected me with uh, animators. There's people who can like scan your painting and like make it move. It's not a skill that I have at all, but there's definitely people out there and getting to know animators and connecting with that is one solution. Um, I've done very simple GIFs just like on Photoshop through different layers on like timeline. And, you know, it doesn't hurt to play around with this when you can. Um, I've also kind of accepted that working digitally in like digital layers with like as textured of a brush as possible is as like is kind of a happy medium for me because the thing about like you know the background could be painted but like you know just like cell animation was like they're just on different layers so maybe that's a moment to have it be a hybrid um and I, I don't have like a perfect answer for this, but I, I definitely think it's, it's like a work in progress for me. And uh, I just recommend if you can learn animation, it's, it's cool. It's time consuming, it's, but it's fun, it's rewarding. Um, or, you know, become really good friends with animators because they're, yeah. they're pretty skillful, amazing people out there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't know. Were you at the icon where the person got up and said, illustrators are dead unless you can animate and it was like <gasps> pandemonium broke out you know people <laughs> throwing their shoes at the podium uh yeah but you know how it is. dare they <laughs> i don't think i was there because i think i would have been yeah. uh either depressed or upset or both yeah all the um, traditional illustrators were, were dying all the animators were like I, I was telling you guys anyway it was much more dramatic than it i mean <laughs> It's really not the case. You, everyone, yeah. you have friends that can help you. You know, you don't have to be a master at all skills. But yeah, it's learning to make some, make, making some gifts. You know, there's there's money in yeah. gifts. Man. That's true. Like the Times used to just ask for like a black and white image. And now they want it in color and black and white. And their budgets haven't gone up. And now sometimes they want things to be animated. It's like these things, it just like slowly creeps up on you and it doesn't hurt to know them. So if you get the chance and like just watch a YouTube video and learn how to do it really quick, it could also be like an expansive experience for your work. Um, I 
I'm trying not to feel intimidated by it, you know, but I, I don't know. I, if you can't do it, there will be people out there who can help you. And there's a lot of super helpful videos out there already. So, you know, the resources are there. Um, hey, Shreyas, are you on? You want to ask your question? Yeah. Hi, Ving. Um, Hi. I, I was hoping you could tell us more about um, the illustration open office hours. Oh, yeah. So, um, or like just in general, like a Yeah, like, like, a plug. <laughs> what, like why did you start it? What is it about? Yeah. So I and a few illustrator friends um, started this thing called open office hours I should probably know the name um but it came after um like the George Floyd protests in the summer um I think there was like a bit of a reckoning with illustration um as far as like how black students were being treated in school and people were coming forth with a lot of experiences and stories that were really negative and racist and I think um as a result of that as well it's like the types of people who are getting work and how they're able to get work um and i think what we're trying to do is to like bridge this information gap and this resource gap of just making things a little bit more transparent and uh accessible as far as you know being able to like ask people questions about things that you just don't know the answers to and so much of like you know you guys are all students in a school so this is like a very great group to be a part of but you know, I, I think we were taught thinking of people who like don't have access to school, who don't have the uh, immediate like network of people, a community, they don't live in New York. Like there's so many different layers of how things can help you uh, become an illustrator or at least provide you with as much like uh, tools as possible versus like if you're just doing things on your own and you don't know where to look and there's no like information hub or community that you can turn to. So we're still like in the beginning stages. Um, we're like, we also wanted the space to be a by POC centered space. So it was going to be, um, you know, all the hosts in the future are going to be by POC. It's not, um, I think there's a lot of illustrators out there who are, you know, white, it's a white dominated field. A lot of our directors are white. I think it's just a matter of getting, um, elevating voices that are marginalized and not heard or um you know don't have an opportunity to be um like there's no connection within the community so we're trying to make this space and it's a work in progress uh you know it's like a volunteer based thing so we just are trying to get together and provide information that's helpful and useful and also like asking questions of our own because um you know, I graduated like over 10 years ago now, a lot of the things that I know may not necessarily be relevant, you know, despite the fact that I just gave a huge presentation about my career, but you know, there's things in there that I think are still useful, but when they're not, we want to try and have people like come together to talk about the things that they know, like, oh, promotion is different now, or like these websites that are free, you can use this to elevate your stuff instead of like having to pay for Squarespace and so on and so forth. So um, yeah, stay tuned. Um, would love to have anyone host if they're, it's like something that people want to talk about or like be a part of that space. Um, we have an Instagram and we have a discord that we kind of all chat on together. Like whenever anyone has like, I have a question about this job or like, you know, can someone look at my sketches and give me some feedback? Like we're trying to make that kind of like, it's an extension of like the school environment of like critique and helpfulness, but it's, it's still like, you know, as good as it's, members and it's you know supporters so um hopefully it's a it's something that will be a good thing and end of plug <laughs> <laughs> uh jonathan you uh, let's do two more questions here jonathan you got uh want to ask your question um uh, sure hi uh so uh, i get i guess i have two sort of related things one is like do you have any things that you like to do that you find personally effective at taking care of yourself and like that work-life balance on the other side of that same question is like are there creative practices things that you do that you could include in your illustration practice but intentionally decide to keep separate um, from the money making side of things yeah good questions um i think the things trying to figure out the separation 
is pretty key for me. Um, as far as like keeping healthy and taking care of myself, I run. Um, that's just something that I find to be very like me time. And I know it's like, you know, half the people here are like groaning. Cause like, who the hell wants to hear that? But like, I, um, it's just honest, you know, like, that's just the thing that I do, but like, you know, some people do yoga, some people go hiking, some people meditate, some people sleep in, you know, like, I don't think there's like one thing. It's, it's simply because you asked me this question. Like I run, I, I try and like stand up and walk around for a little bit. Like when I'm at my desk for too long, I try and drink water. They're like really basic trying to stay healthy things. So, you know, and um, I walk to the studio every day now. So that's also like a little bit, it's just time when I'm not like looking at my phone and worrying about what's in there. Like that to me is like me time, help, helpful health time. Um, and as far as like intentionally things that I intentionally leave out of my practice for that's like money making, I don't know. I, I, I hope this is like answering your question right, but like sometimes I'll just like draw things for myself that's like I don't share, I don't promote, I don't sell, I don't because I, I want to preserve a part of illustration, like the joy of why I entered this career in the first place to be like for me. Because if I'm giving everything away, I feel I won't have anything left at the end of the day, if that makes sense. Like, um, I think I also don't like, I know a lot of people do like merch stuff, like they'll make like little pins and posters and things. And that's all great too. And I, I buy a lot of those, but I, I don't do it myself because I, I find it difficult to figure out like all the mechanics of like sending things and placing orders. But I also think like, as um, like, I, I also don't want to like make things that people don't want to keep forever. Like, I don't think that those things are disposable. I just think like for myself, like my work is like, they usually are just like paintings there. I don't have like ideas for little pins that are um, as sellable. So um, I guess in that sense, I don't really do that line of stuff. So uh, I carve out as much of like what brings me joy to draw or paint or explore. Like there's a little bit of a playground for myself that I keep in uh, like, you know, away from social media, away from anything because ultimately it's like, you don't want your well to dry out, right? Like maybe those things will influence ideas when I feel better about them, but I also don't want to be like, here's everything like here's me all the time like here I did this like I, I farted everybody know you know it's like I just I don't think that that's like that is would be very depleting for me and therefore it would make it very difficult to stay healthy here <laughs> I hope that was right. helpful La oh sorry Ping. last question uh Aaron you want to you want to ask your question I'm the last one that's fabulous um hi um hi Thank you so much for your talk. Um, I really enjoyed it. I like how honest you were. That really resonates with me when people are like, my life kind of sucked for a little while, um, but I'm here. Um, so yeah, thank you for that. I have a question about, um, you talk a lot about community and a lot of us are about to graduate and kind of disperse throughout the country. <laughs> and I'm really worried about <laughs> finding community, local community and, um, and, and friends. I don't mean to sound like, how do you make friends? But like, how do you make illustrator friends? Um, a lot of people talk about fests, but is there anything other than that? <laughs> I mean, well, thank you for enjoying my honest talk. It's like a double-edged sword, I feel <laughs> like. Sometimes I'm like, I'm too revealing. Um, but I have been in that boat of like, I don't have any friends. Like, you know, when I was in London, that was like all, all I'd wake up and I'd just be like, where are my friends? How do I make them? And I was like, I can't just go into a bar and be like, hello, will you be my friend? Like, it just feels so unnatural and weird. But I do think in that sense, like, you know, you're welcome to join our OO Discord, first of all. Like, there's a lot of really nice people on there and they're all over the place as well. Um, I think as horrible as social media can be on our souls, like, it's definitely if you're looking past like what the work is, like the content, like having actual conversations with people is something that's like 
inevitably going to be the thing that will make it feel good, right? Like we're having a bit of a conversation here. You can, I don't know, like I say this as if I do it, but I don't like have a pen pal or like, you know, it's, it's these things that like, if you, if you connect with someone and you, you just want to have like a conversation back and forth. I've definitely had like email conversations with people um, who just had like questions about things. And then, you know, if they're ever in New York, like I, I love meeting whoever's visiting. It was something that I experienced when I visited as well. Like people opening up their studios, like kind of inviting people into your space is something that I find to be like community building and like really encouraging. I don't say like you have to move to New York, but like if you ever get a chance, like these doors are always open. You're definitely welcome to come. This goes to everybody, not just, not just to Aaron, but um, I think there's, it's like such an isolating type of work. And I think everyone understands that. Like we're all extremely isolated now and being able to like have those conversations on a basic level is just really helpful. And I, I think after school, like I tried to keep in touch with as many of my classmates as possible you know, over time, it's, you know, it's not always going to be perfect, you know, people have their own lives, and you drift apart. But I think as illustrators, like in order to kind of like maintain a level of community, it's because we have all these things in common, right? Like we know what it's like to sit inside and like draw all day and like have a hunchback and like, it's, you know, things that you can commiserate over and like, fests are nice. I think people look forward to those things as people look forward to like, um, like illustration parties that are in New York or like just any reason to gather around like-minded people. Some people use icon for that reason. Like they'll go to the conference to like meet other illustrators. But honestly, I think if there's someone that you just want to like try and have a conversation with, you like their work, you can reach out to them and just like let them know, you know, just, I think the honesty aspect of being like, Hey, it's been really lonely. I'm just like, just want to just reach out and say hi like most people who are human and have a heart will like respond to that and in, in a compassionate way so I hope you don't feel too isolated and lonely you know the invitation is extended and is open forever like you know I know one day we'll all be able to get on an airplane and not harden and feel paranoid but you know it's um I think that reassurance and encouragement is also helpful so just keep in touch with each other. It's, it's great. I, I also have a shared studio space and that's also something you can consider like wherever you end up, like you can look for artist communities. Um, you know, there's always some rundown warehouse that's like filled with artists. Right. So that's uh, something that I found really helpful because we're able to like pod together or like socialize or kind of talk about illustration, but also like expand on things that are not illustration and things like that. So um, I just, know myself well enough like the working from home solo thing is really hard if I see my bed I'm just gonna want to get in it so I'm like gotta go to work gotta gotta go to a new space and you know it's something that I work towards and count in as my overhead as well so it's like understanding like what's possible and working towards those goals if that's what you need much like how people pay for therapy you know it's like these are just things that if you need it then there will be a way um to hopefully get the help you need and the environment that you want so I hope that helps. Yeah, you know, we were we were promised a, a Josh Cochran or Sam Weber sighting in the background. No one's I, here. So I told them I was going to do this. And um, well, I mean, I would like to say that my space is infinitely cleaner than theirs. Uh -huh. They're sloppy. They work in a pile of papers and trash. I don't know how they do it, but they're not here to defend themselves. So you'll just have to believe me. That's right. <laughs> they're messy. I'm sorry. It's just it's just something that I've noticed. <laughs> well you may get uh 30 pen pal requests after this talk oh okay yeah. that's fine i will try my best to respond and if it's you know like the discord is there i like going on there and chatting with the people on there just you know because everyone is interesting to me so um yeah I, I will help where i can but i it's like that's the thing like i don't really know the answers to this is just like grain of salt like please just <laughs> consider this but like it's not everything i'm sure there's someone out there who's like what is she talking about like she's wrong don't be that honest you know but like hopefully there was some some aspect of this that was helpful and if oh, not then i'm fun. sorry that it no, took an hour of your time <laughs> well we're gonna wrap it there um so we'll post this uh, talk online if you want to revisit some of her strategies and tips and steal her email again um so uh 
so Ping's going to visit uh, the IVC group, and let's let's take fifteen minutes uh, break, and we'll so we'll get back together at uh, ten forty on on that other link. Okay, thanks everyone. Thank, Thank you. you so much, everyone, for spending your morning with me. Thank you. <laughs> Thank this is the most great. spaces I've seen in such a long time. <laughs> 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 like moving humans, amazing. <laughs> Have a good day. See ya.